In this PowerPoint, we're going to review some of the basics of chemical nomenclature. There are a wide variety of different compounds out there and an equal diversity in their naming systems. We just don't have time to cover all of these, so we're going to focus on three types. Ionic compounds, simple inorganic molecular compounds, and acids. We'll start with ionic compounds. So if ionic compound formulas always follow the format of cation followed by anion, the name of the compound mirrors that. It's always the name of the cation followed by the name of the anion. The trickiest part here is that there are four different categories of ions and each of those categories has their own naming system. So you have to figure out what type of ion you're dealing with and name it accordingly. Here are the different ion types. For cations, these include fixed charge metals. So these are elemental metal ions that have the same charge, a predictable charge, that we can figure out based upon the position of the metal on the periodic table. These are our representative metals, and they're generally called type 1. You can also have variable charge metals, however. These are generally your transition metals and some of the heavier metals on the table. And you can't necessarily predict the charge because these metals can actually have multiple charges. So it could be one of two or three different charges usually. That means that the name of the ion has to indicate the charge that you're dealing with in that compound. These are also known as type two metals. Our third group are the polyatomics and they can fall on both sides. You can have cations and you can have polyatomic anions. Most of the polyatomics are actually anions. There's only one really common cation and that's ammonium, NH4+. And finally, we have our representative nonmetal anions. So these are fixed charge. We can predict what that charge is going to be based upon the position of these nonmetals on the periodic table. So the type 1 metal cations mostly come from the representative columns of the periodic table, particularly columns 1 and 2. There are also a few other metals from other columns on the table, 11, 12, and 13. It's really important to know that not all of the metals in these particular columns have these predictable ion charges. But you should know that the ones represented here, aluminum, zinc, cadmium, and silver, all form single charge ions. In terms of naming these ions, it's pretty simple. The cation name simply equals the metal name. The type two metals are usually the transition metals, but they also include a few heavy metals, particularly those from the bottom of columns 13 and 14. So these metals don't have a predictable ion charge. For example, chromium, when it forms ions, can actually form chromiums with a two plus charge, a three plus charge, or a six plus charge. To indicate which charge we're dealing with, we actually put that charge number as a Roman numeral in parentheses following the name of the metal. That's the ion name for a type two metal. So the chromium with a six plus charge is actually known as chromium six with the six written as a Roman numeral in parentheses. The monoatomic or representative nonmetal anions come from columns 14, 15, 16, and 17 of the periodic table. The charge on the ion can be predicted, of course, from the column number or the position of the element on the table. The name of these ions is simply the same as the element name, but we change the ending to IDE. So for example, carbon becomes carbide when it's in its ionic form. Nitrogen becomes nitride, oxygen oxide, and so forth. 
finally we have the polyatomics. This is not an exhaustive list, but it contains quite a few of the common ones. So polyatomics have their own unique names, and these are the same names that we use for them in ionic compounds. It helps to become familiar with the different polyatomics, their formulas, and their names. Use the reference sheet that's available on Blackboard to help you start learning all of these different polyatomics. Let's go through a few naming examples for ionic compounds. You may find this easier to follow along if you refer to that ion reference sheet as we go. So we'll start with the compound formula MgF2. I need to separate this into my cation and anion and make sure that I have an appropriate name for each of those. So I only have two elements in this formula, which makes it pretty easy to separate into cation and anion. The first element is going to be the cation, the second the anion. And I know magnesium is in column two of the periodic table. It's one of the representative columns, so it's a type one metal. It always has a plus two charge, and the name of the ion is the same as the name of the metal. Fluorine is also in one of the representative columns on the non-metal side. It's column 17. So this means a negative one charge on the ion. And it also means that we change the ending of the element to IDE. So fluorine becomes fluoride. And when we combine those two together in our compound name, it's magnesium fluoride. Let's look at another example. So in this formula, again, I only have two elements, so I break them apart. The first is my cation, the second is my anion. The iron is actually a transition metal. So how do I know that I'm dealing with iron with a plus three here instead of the other option for iron, which is iron with a plus two charge? The answer is that I look at the subscript on the anion. So my chloride always has a negative one charge associated with it. And if in the formula that I'm given, I have a three for the chloride, for the subscript, that means I have three of these negative one charges. That's a total charge of negative three my iron has to balance that out. So my one iron has to be a plus three charge total, which means that the name of this cation is iron three, and we write that three is Roman numeral in parentheses. And it also means that my final compound name is iron three chloride. Okay, so this formula is a little bit more complicated. I actually have three element symbols here. And those element symbols all represent non-metals. So how do I know that this is an ionic compound? So this is where you have to know those polyatomics. I, ought, I know that NH4 when I see that particular grouping, that particular formula, always represents the polyatomic cation ammonium. And whatever follows it in the formula has to be my anion. In this case, that's a chlorine. So my cation is ammonium. I look up the name for that particular grouping on that list of polyatomics, and I use that name exactly in the compound name. My anion is chlorine, which we change the ending to IDE since it's one of my representative nonmetals. And my final compound name is just ammonium chloride. And my last example also has three elements in the formula. How do I know where to break this up into cation and anion? Well, in this case, if your compound formula starts with a metal, you always take just the metal as your cation. And whatever comes after that metal is going to end up being your anion. So calcium is a type one metal, it's in column two. That means we have the representative charge of two plus and the ion name is the same as the element name. 
sulfate, that SO4 grouping, we look up on our polyatomic list and we discover that its name is actually sulfate, S-U-L-F-A-T-E. There's also a sulfite on that list, so be careful as you go through that you are getting the correct name and that you are getting the ending on those polyatomics correct. We combine those two names in our final compound to have calcium sulfate. There's a wide variety of different molecular compounds. You can have simple inorganic molecules like carbon dioxide, and we call these binary molecules because they contain only two types of non-metallic elements. You can also have larger organic molecules that have a central backbone made out of carbon atoms like the butane molecule depicted here. And finally, you can have huge biomolecules, like the hemoglobin protein depicted here. It's so large that we can't represent individual atoms. Instead, we draw these ribbons to indicate the polypeptide chains and how they twist and curve around each other to make this large, large protein molecule. So there are separate courses for organic chemistry and biochemistry, and you will cover the appropriate naming systems for those type of molecules in those courses. Our focus will be on inorganic molecules, and we're gonna separate this into two types, the simple binary molecules and acids. Let's start with the simple binary molecules. To name these compounds, we use prefixes to indicate the amount of each nonmetal. And the general format for the name is the prefix for the number of the first element in the formula, followed by the name of that element. Then a prefix for the number of the second element, then the base name of the second element with an IDE ending. Let's look at an example. N2F4, we have two nitrogens, so that's dinitrogen, and four fluorines, so that's tetrafluoride. Dinitrogen tetrafluoride. Here's another example. CO. So the convention is that the one prefix that we never use on the first nonmetal is mono. So even though I have one carbon here, I start with just carbon. I don't say monocarbon. I can use that prefix mono, though, on the second nonmetal. So this particular compound is known as carbon monoxide. And there's one other convention associated with this naming, and that's when you have an element that actually starts with a vowel for their name, then you often drop the A at the end of the prefix. So here's an example of that, S2O5. I have two of those sulfurs, so we'll start with disulfur. And then I have five of the oxygens, so that's pentaoxide. But I don't say pentaoxide, I say disulfur pentoxide. Acids are molecular compounds, so they're made up of only nonmetals that are covalently bonded together. But they have the unique property that when the molecules are dissolved in water, they break apart, releasing hydrogen ions and an anion. So they are molecular compounds, but when they're in water, and only when they're in water, they actually release ions like an ionic compound would. So the convention for the formulas of an acid is that the hydrogen that breaks off is always written first. And whatever follows that hydrogen is the anion that will also be released in water. So these equations show that dissociation of the acids represented here. And you can see that the hydrogen forms a hydrogen ion and whatever is left over becomes the anion.
So in this case, it's NO3, the nitrate anion. In the top one, it's chloride anion. The AQ in these reactions actually means that the substance is dissolved in water. The naming system for these acids when they're dissolved in water is based on the anion name, in particular the ending of the anion name. So if the anion ends in ATE, we change the ending to IC acid. If it ends in ITE, we change it to OU acid. And if it ends in IDE, we actually add the prefix hydro as well as the ending IC acid. Let's look at some examples of this and we'll start with the IDE ending. It turns out that ending is always associated with our representative monoatomic nonmetal anions like fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide. So that means that uh, the acids that form with these anions are called binary acids because there's only two elements present. And that means that they always take the form of hydro as a prefix with the IC acid ending. So HF is hydrofluoric acid. HCl is hydrochloric acid, HBr is hydrobromic acid, and so forth. Now the ATE endings and ITE endings are always associated with polyatomic anions, and in particular, polyatomics that contain oxygen. So when we see these endings on the anions, we're talking about oxy acids for the polyatomic oxygen. And it's really important to pay attention to those fine differences between the ATE endings and the ITE endings. For example, nitrate anion is NO3. When it's combined with H in HNO3, it's nitric acid. Nitrite anion is NO2. Combined with H, it becomes HNO2 or nitrous acid. The acetate anion is C2H3O2. As an acid, it's acetic acid. SO4 is the sulfate anion. The convention for this is actually, we still add the IC acid ending, but instead of calling it sulfic acid, we actually revert back to the base name of the element sulfur, and it's actually called sulfuric acid. I'm not sure why this is the convention, but this is the way we do it. We do something similar for phosphate, which is PO4. Instead of phosphic acid, it's actually called phosphoric acid. In summary, ionic compounds are named by combining the cation name followed by the anion name. Binary inorganic compounds are named using prefixes to indicate the number of each element present in the molecule. It is the only naming system out of these three categories that uses the prefixes. Aqueous acid names are based on the anion formed when the acid ionizes in water.